Hello everyone. Welcome to our series of lectures on head and neck embryology. In this series of lectures, we will be discussing briefly regarding the developmental aspects of head and neck, including brain, and we will also discuss the certain congenital anomalies, which are the clinical aspects of the developmental events. This is lecture 1. In this lecture, we will be discussing briefly on the development of the tongue will cover the developmental events for the development of mucous membrane and test birds of the tongue. We will discuss the development of the skeletal muscles of the tongue and we will end up our discussion by having a brief overview about the congenital anomalies which are associated with the development of tongue. So we will start our discussion from the adult tongue. Adult tongue anatomically can be divided into anterior to two third portion, which is also known as body of the tongue, and posterior one third portion, which is also known as root of the tongue. Why we divide the adult tongue into anterior and posterior portion is that there are different sets of innervation on these two aspects of the tongue so that these two regions differ developmentally and shorten innerv innervation aspects as well that's why the anat Anatomically, adult tongue has been divided into anterior two-third and posterior one-third. In the adult tongue, we can also see the median sulcus, which indicates the line of fusion between bilateral aspects of this anterior two-third of the tongue. We will see or we will understand how the median sulcus is actually being developed. How this sulcus terminalis is actually being developed. And we will see some of the test birds with the innervation. So, before starting our discussion, we need to have a brief concept on the pharyngeal apparatus because during the fourth week of intrauterine life this developmental events regarding the development of tongue is actually initiated it starts from the middle portion this middle portion of the pharyngeal apparatus is also known as pharyngeal iris it can actually be memorized with the mnemonics c a p cap from outside to inside C stands for pharyngeal cleft, A for pharyngeal arch, and P for pharyngeal pouch. Outermost of the pharyngeal apparatus, this pharyngeal cleft or pharyngeal groove is ectodermal in origin. Pharyngeal arch is mesodermal in origin and pharyngeal pouch is endodermal in origin. The endodermal lining of the pharyngeal arch, okay, the endodermal lining, they give rise to certain thickening. In the floor of the pharynx this represents the floor of the pharynx and they are in relation with this structure known as foramen cecum foramen cecum carries its importance when we will be discussing the development of the thyroid gland we will discuss how the foramen cecum along with the thyroglossal duct gives rise to the thyroid gland but that's not our point of discussion right here we will be having foramen cecum just as an anatomical landmark regarding the development of the tongue. So, cranial to foramen cecum, we have three swelling, two lateral swelling, and one median swelling. The two lateral swelling is also known as lateral lingual swelling, and one median swelling is also known as tuberculum impar. Caudal to foramen cecum, you have large median swelling or median eminence also known as hypobranchial eminence the hypobranchial eminence is divided into two person cranial most portion of hypobranchial eminence and caudal most portion of hypobranchial eminence 
Now we must be wise enough to understand that the first pharyngeal iris is actually in relation to the cranial region. Cranial in the sense that the cranial cranium, all the structures which are developing cranial to the foramen cecum, they are in relation with the first pharyngeal iris, and all the structures which are caudal to foramen cecum, they are in relation with the second, third, and fourth pharyngeal iris. That's why all the innervation of the adult derivative from this structure will be by the Rs of first nerve and from these structures will be by the Rs of second, third and fourth nerve. We will discuss briefly how these swellings actually develop into adult tongue. We will discuss about foramen secum and thyroglossal duct in our next module on development of thyroid gland. So until now we have developed five developmental swelling, two lateral lingual swelling, one median swelling also known as tuberculum impar and one actually it's one median swelling on the caudal, uh, caudal region to foramen secum but it has again been divided into cranial part and caudal part. So there are two parts of the hypobranchial eminence cranial part of the hyperbranchial eminence and caudal part of hyperbranchial eminence. In our next picture, we can see the adult derivative of the tongue. So, from the figure, we can analyze that these two structures, they are giving rise to the anterior two-third of the tongue. They are actually from the lingual swelling in relation with the first pharyngeal iris. This Greenish structure or cranial part of hyperbranchial eminence is giving rise to posterior one third of the tongue and they are in relation with the third pharyngeal iris. And the posterior must region or the caudal part of hyperbranchial eminence or, the, or this bluish structure is giving rise to posterior must part of the tongue and the epiglottis of the larynx. And they are in relation with the first pharyngeal iris. So this is our point of concern. How these two lateral lingual swellings are giving rise to anterior two third, and we must we might have certain doubt that this median structure tuberculum impar is not actually not giving rise to any prominent structure in the adult tongue. The point is that during the developmental event these two lingual soilings will overgrow in such a way that they actually cover the tuberculum impar and hence tuberculum impar cannot give rise to any structure in the adult tongue. Now let's understand how the anterior two-third of the tongue is actually being developed. So we have already formed lateral lingual swelling and these two lateral lingual swelling they start growing towards each other they start approximating towards each other and they meet at this median point also known as the median sulcus which can be demonstrated in the adult tongue they start growing towards each other they start growing towards each other and they actually merge at the midline they start growing each other okay they start growing towards each other they start growing towards each other and they actually merge with each other in the midline and this merging point this is known as the median sulcus so we have understood that this first pharyngeal iris the nerve of the first pharyngeal iris is innervating this anterior to third of the tongue so of course, this structure will be innervating by the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve or the th third cranial nerve. The tuberculum impar, it actually does not form any recognizable part of the adult tongue. So, by the anterior two third of the tongue, we mean to say the mucous membrane of the tongue and test board of the tongue. 
we haven't formed the skeletal muscles of the tongue yet. We have only formed the skeletal framework onto which skeletal muscle can be fit. So we have only formed the mucous membrane and the test board on the anterior to third of the tongue. Please be confirmed. We haven't formed the skeletal muscles of the tongue yet. Now we will form the posterior one third of the tongue so that the anterior one th anterior two third and the posterior one third can be merged or they will be meeting with each other and they will form the proper three by three or the proper tongue so the posterior two third of the tongue and posterior most aspect of the tongue they are actually formed by the hypobranchial eminence so we have already uh, divided hyperbranchial eminence into cranial region and the caudal region. The cranial region of the hyperbranchial eminence, they are in relation with the third pharyngeal arch, and they give rise to the posterior one third of the tongue. So the line of fusion between the anterior two third, or the body of the tongue, and posterior one third, a root of the tongue. Is demarcated by this v-shaped furrow known as v-shaped groove known as sulcus terminalis and in front of the sulcum ter sulcus terminalis we have circumvallate papilla this circumvallate papilla they are not innervated by the nerve of the first pharyngeal arch or the nerve which is actually innervating the uh, anterior to third of the tongue instead the circumvallate papillae will be innervated by the nerve of this posterior one-third of the tongue that is also known as hypoglossal nerve so the mucous membrane of the posterior one-third of the tongue develops from the third pharyngeal arch which is uh, the cranial portion of the hypobranchial eminence now we have formed anterior two third and posterior one third of the tongue but they are formed separately we haven't fused or they are not meeting with each other although we have already stated that the line of fusion between these two structure will be represented by the sulcus terminalis in the adult tongue this v shaped groove also known as sulcus terminalis in the adult tongue we already know that they are meeting with each other in the sulcus terminalis, but we haven't stated how these two structures are meeting with each other. Because this anterior two third of the tongue is in relation with the first pharyngeal arch, while posterior one third of the tongue are developed from uh, developed in relation to the third pharyngeal arch. So where is the second pharyngeal arch? I know why this second pharyngeal arch is not creating a barrier between the fusion of these two structures. So we will see actually how this third pharyngeal arch overcomes this issue. So during the course of development, we can see here this one is first pharyngeal arch, this one is second pharyngeal arch and this one is third pharyngeal arch and this posterior most region is the fourth pharyngeal arch so during the course of development this third pharyngeal arch they actually overgrow they actually overgrow the second pharyngeal arch and the second pharyngeal arch gets buried over the second pharyngeal arch gets buried over the third pharyngeal arch now the third pharyngeal arch when it's approximating towards the first pharyngeal arch and it's growing over the second pharyngeal arch it actually meets the posterior most region of the first pharyngeal arch and in this process of development it forms a v-shaped group which will be demarcated by the sulcus terminalis in the adult tongue now we must be thinking that the second pharyngeal arch 
is not giving rise to any proper derivative in the adult tongue except that the nerve of the second pharyngeal arch. We know the nerve of the second pharyngeal arch is the facial nerve and this facial nerve has something to do with the innervation in the certain aspect of the tongue. We will see how the second pharyngeal arch nerve innervates the adult tongue. So until now we have developed anterior two third and posterior one third of the tongue. But we have developed only the mucous membrane and the test bird of the tongue. We have developed only the mucous membrane and the test bird of the tongue. We haven't developed skeletal muscle of the tongue eight. We have created only the skeletal framework, only the framework onto which skeletal muscle now can fit. So let's understand how the muscle of the tongue is developing. So we must be clear that the there are different sets of origin for the mucous membrane of the tongue and for the muscle of the tongue. Mucous membrane of the tongue is the anterior two third and posterior one third of the tongue, which are developed from these pharyngeal arches, and the framework which are formed like the mucous membrane. The framework is the skeletal onto which the skeletal muscle gets fitted. Now if we have certain idea regarding the gross anatomy of the tongue, we know that the tongue has certain extrinsic muscle and certain intrinsic muscle. Regarding the extrinsic intrinsic muscle, their innervation, their origin and insertion, we will discuss in our next module on the gross anatomy of the tongue. But before that, we need to understand how this uh, a skeletal muscle of the tongue is being developed. So we have already dealt about it. So regarding the posterior must and the epiglottis part of the tongue, they are formed from this caudal part of this hyperbranchial eminence. I was talking about hyperbranchial eminence for very uh, repeatedly uh, during the uh, development of the anterior, uh, during the development of the posterior one third of the tongue. And it is like this. This is the hyperbranchial eminence as a whole and divided into a larger cranial portion, a smaller caudal portion. Caudal cranial portion giving rise to the mucous membrane of the anterior one third of the tongue and caudal portion of hyperbranchial eminence giving rise to the mucous membrane of the posterior most part of the tongue. Mucous membrane of the posterior most part of the tongue. And these two structures and uh, this uh, uh, cranial part of the hyperbranchial eminence they are in relation with the third pharyngeal arch the third pharyngeal arch actually overgrow the second pharyngeal arch second pharyngeal arch gets buried over the uh, third pharyngeal arch and now these uh, two structures uh, they approximate towards each other and they fuse with each other to form the adult tongue and the line of fusion between the anterior two-third and the posterior one-third of the tongue is uh, demarcated by the sulcus terminalis which is a v-shaped group and the this structure is the foramen cecum having a certain relation uh, with the development of the thyroid gland and in the posterior must region we have the epiglottis now during the gastrulation or the third week event the three jom layers are actually established ectoderm mesoderm and endoderm and now we are developing the skeletal muscles of the tongue and we all know that the muscles are mesoderma in origin so in this fetal life or in this embryological not the fetal life in this embryological life we need to find where is the mesoderm because we know there are three mesoderms are present so here is the presence of neural tube with the notochord and this lateral to this notochord or the neural tube we have these two structures also known as paraaxial mesoderm para means just besides axial means axial line so we have two paraaxial mesoderm we have intermediately intermediate mesoderm and we have lateral plate mesoderm this lateral plate mesoderm 
uh, can be divided into so much uh, splanchnopleuric mesoderm which gives rise to the visceral structure visceral uh, linings and somatopleuric mesoderm which gives rise to the non visceral lining this intermediate mesoderm has something to do with the development of the kidney and gonads and here comes the role of the paraaxial mesoderm this paraaxial mesoderm actually form the somites or the somatomeres so from the process of gastrulation we have developed a mesoderm we have three mesoderm paraxial mesoderm intermediate mesoderm lateral plate mesoderm here the role of the paraxial mesoderm which gives rise to the somites and the first formed somites are the uh, they are the occipital somites so the occipital somites they have two structures occipital myotomes and hypoglossal cord hypoglossal cord gives rise to hypoglossal nerve hypoglossal cord developing from occipital somites gives rise to hypoglossal nerve and this occipital myotomes developing from occipital somites gives rise to the muscles of the tongue so we must be clear now that the hypoglossal nerve developing from the same structure as the muscles of the tongue that is from the occipital somites all the motor innervation of the tongue will be from the hypoglossal nerve there is one exception which we will discuss in our last slide so all the motor innervation of the tongue is by the hypoglossal nerve all the motor innervation we are not talking about the sensory innervation or we are not talking about the special sensation from the tongue we are only talking about the motor innervation for example if i am speaking here there is the motor events of the tongue so during the process of movement of the tongue hypoglossal nerve is being involved is playing a crucial role now we need to see how these occipital myotomes give rise to the skeletal muscles of the tongue so here in this cross section we have this outermost ectodermal layer we have ectodermal layer and we just cut this ectodermal layer to expose the inner mesodermal layer this is the developing this is the neural tube neural tube has already been developed and these are just lateral to the neural tube uh, if this is the cross section and this is the neural tube just lateral to the neural tube we have mesoderm that is known as which is also known as paraaxial mesoderm so this paraaxial mesoderm are in relation with the lateral aspect of the neural tube so here in the picture we can see developing somites from the paraaxial mesoderm and these somites give rise to the occipital myotomes occipital myotomes is formed from these developing somites and these developing somites give rise to occipital myotomes with the hypoglossal cord hypoglossal cord gives rise to the hypoglossal nerve so occipital myotomes is formed from these somites also the hypoglossal nerve so here in the picture we have uh, shown the adult nerve but the hypoglossal cord gives rise to the hypoglossal nerve occipital myotomes hypoglossal cord both are developing from these somites occipital somites and the occipital somites migrate along its way to form the uh, to develop the muscle of the tongue so the muscles of the tongue they actually develop from the myoblast and uh, in the uh, and they migrate into the developing tongue from these occipital myotomes hypoglossal nerve the nerve of the occipital myotomes which are accompanying the myoblast during their migration to the pharyngeal arches and innervates the muscles of the tongue as they develop migration of the occipital myotomes to the developing tongue the migration of the occipital myotomes the root of migration of the occipital myotomes to the muscles of the tongue it explains the course of the hypoglossal nerve so muscles of the tongue we have already formed 
the mucous membrane or mucous lining of the tongue or its its test burst now we are forming the muscles of the tongue from the occipital mitoms uh, innervated by the hypoglossal nerve there is certain theory which explains or which predicts that some of the muscles of the tongue probably develop in, in situ so in this picture also we can see the developing uh, migrating occipital mitoms so here in the pictures we can uh, see the extrinsic and intrinsic muscles extrinsic muscles includes the uh, palatoglossus muscle histaloglossus muscle hyoglossus and genioglossus muscles regarding the intrinsic muscles it includes the superior longitudinal muscle inferior longitudinal muscle transverse muscle vertical muscle so these are the extrinsic and intrinsic muscles of the tongue so we have already understood how the skeletal muscles of the tongue are developed so this is our summary slide regarding the developmental aspect of the tongue which includes the how the anterior two-third of the tongue is being developed or uh, and how the posterior one-third of the tongue that's only the mucous membrane of the tongue along with the test bursts are formed from the intradermal lining and from the intradermal lining of the uh, first and second pharyngeal arts but uh, actually from the first pharyngeal arts they're actually from the first pharyngeal arts and uh, how the uh, posterior one third of the tongue are formed from the third pharyngeal arts and how this third pharyngeal arts overgrow the second pharyngeal arts and they form the first pharyngeal arts and how this posterior most part of the tongue is being developed so this was actually from the first pharyngeal arts from the caudal region of the hyperbranchial eminence and we have developed the muscles of the tongue from the occipital mitome so this can be our good summary slide regarding the innervation of the tongue we have already understood that the gen that uh, first let's understand about the muscles of the tongue so we understood about the how the hypoglossal nerve that's from the hypoglossal cord uh, that uh, uh, it, it, it innervates uh, the muscles of the tongue so, uh, so except the palatoglossus muscle which are innervating by the pharyngeal branch of the vagus nerve all the motor innervation of the muscles of the tongue is from the hypoglossal nerve and regarding the uh, there are uh, regarding the uh, anterior two third and posterior one third of the tongue there are certain differences so the anterior two third of the tongue we have understood that they are in relation with the first pharyngeal arts and hence they must be supplied from the branch of the first nerve sorry uh, from the first arch nerve so that is the mandibular branch or uh, mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve that is for the general general sensation to the first anterior two third of the uh, nerve sorry anterior two third of, of the tongue so regarding the special sensation there is only difference in the anterior two third of the tongue only in the anterior two third of the tongue there are different nerves for general sensation and the special sensation A special sensation in the sense that for the sense of test regarding general sensation we mean to say that when we uh, put the food uh, put food in our mouth or keep uh, while keeping food in our mouth the general texture of food uh, general uh, touch of uh, food with the surface of the tongue they are taken by uh, by the general sensation but after the food being dissolved the sensation of taste will be taken by the different nerve that is by the nerve of the second hours the nerve of second hours is the facial nerve so coda tympani branch of the facial nerve it carries the special sensation from the anterior to third of the tongue so there is difference only in the anterior to third of the tongue for the general and the special sensation but in the posterior one third of the tongue and posterior most part of the tongue there are no difference it means that the same nerve which carries the general sensation carries the special sensation it means that the nerve of uh, posterior one third of the tongue is the third pharyngeal arch nerve that is the glossopharyngeal nerve which is the branch of the uh, which is the nerve of the third arch show this glossopharyngeal nerve carries both sensory sensation as well as general sensation of 
sorry, uh, carries both general touch sensation and special sensation of taste. And the super and the regarding the posterior most the superior laryngeal nerve carries both general sensation as well as special sensation. We can summarize it, it uh, like this. Regarding the taste, taste is considered to be the special sensation of the tongue. So, special sensation differs only in the anterior two-third of the tongue. Only in the anterior two-third of the tongue, there are different nerve for general and special sensation. That is, from the anterior two-third of the tongue, general sensation is carried by nerve of the first hours which is the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve. We need not uh, uh, need to understand about the post-traumatic branch. That is about the, uh, uh, there are two branches, pre and the post-traumatic branch, and only the post-traumatic branch of the first arts uh, remains. But uh, all we need to remember is that for the general sensation, that is by the nerve of the first arts, which we all know, that is the mandibular branch of the trigeminal nerve from the anterior to third of the tongue, but the special sensation is by the nerve of the second pharyngeal arch, is the facial nerve. And from the posterior one third of the tongue, and from the posterior one third of the tongue, they are by the glossopharyngeal nerve, which is the nerve of the third arch. So both the general sensation, okay, both the general sensation as well as the special sensation is by the glossopharyngeal nerve regarding the posterior most part of the nerve this posterior most part of the of the tongue they are by the again by the vagus nerve which is the superior laryngeal branch of the vagus nerve so we have seen that they differ only in the anterior to third of the tongue and the motor innervation is by the hypoglossal nerve and this pharyngeal branch of the vagus nerve, hypoglossal nerve innervates all the muscles of the tongue except palatoglossus muscle. Palatoglossus muscle is innervated by the pharyngeal branch of the vagus nerve. So this is our last slide regarding the certain congenital anomalies of the tongue. So if there is a complete agenesis of the, of the tongue primordia, then it gives rise to the condition known as a glossia. Here in the picture, we can see there is no tongue in the uh, floor of the mouth of this child. So this condition is known as a glossia. And if uh, only uh, one lateral lingual swelling is formed, and if one lateral lingual swelling fails to form, then it gives rise to, then only the half section of the tongue will be formed known as the hemiglossia, microglossia, very small tongue, macroglossia, very large tongue, also known as the, uh, there is a structure, no, uh, condition known as the tongue tie or ankyloglossia. Here in the picture, we can see ankyloglossia. So it occurs when this frenulum of tongue extends to the tip of the tongue. This frenulum of the tongue extends to the tip of the tongue so that the further protrusion of the tongue is prevented and it causes difficulty in speech. Bifid tongue is like the tongue of a snake. It's, uh, it's the condition here in the picture we can see bifid tongue. So it's the condition in which the anterior portion of the tongue gets splitted. This anterior portion of the tongue gets splitted into two small parts and it is caused by the failure of fusion of two lateral lingual swelling. So if there is no uh, complete fuse, uh, fusion of the two lateral lingual swelling, then of course they have, uh, this tongue gets bifeted. And lingual thyroid is, uh, okay, this uh, uh, is the congenital anomaly which we will be discussing even uh, in our module on the development of thyroid gland. So lingual thyroid is that uh, during the course of development of thyroid gland, uh, the, from the foramen cecum, uh, thyroid gland, it actually migrates thyroid gland so uh, uh, i can uh, demonstrate it here thyroid gland it actually migrates from the foramen cecum along the thyroglossal duct to in front of the uh, uh, laryngeal cartilages so in relation with the hyoid bone it will be uh, growing like this so if there is a failure of fusion a failure of migration of the thyroid gland from the uh, from its development developing site 
so if there is no uh, route of migration so if a thyroid gland fails to uh, fails to migrate then thyroid gland remains here as ectopic uh, thyroid gland as ectopic as uh, not as ectopic gland just it remains here it doesn't migrate downward so the thyroid gland will be present uh, in the uh, tongue region and this is this condition is known as uh, lingual thyroid and lingual thyroid has a certain uh, clinical association in the sense that if a thyroid gland if this lingual thyroid is the only thyroid present in the uh, human body then if we dissect uh, this uh, thyroid gland then of course there won't be any thyroid gland in the person's body so there won't be any source of the thyroid gland and the person gets hypothyroidism so we need to uh, have a radio isotope i iodine 131 treasure technique to understand the uh, location of the thyroid gland in case of the lingual thyroid and you can uh, see whether there are other sources of thyroid gland as well before uh, thyroidectomy so this concludes our presentation on the developmental aspects of the uh, tongue so thank you